Um, I still need to get, when I see it, I still want to be a little bit more lean in my hamstrings and into my glutes. Uh, that was one of my biggest feedback. But um, definitely my back and my shape was mm -hmm. what I was really focused on. You really on. improved your lat width. That's impressive. Thank you. Was there any uh, specific type of, um, uh, you know, training approach that you changed uh, during that time? Or what uh, What did that look like for you? Um, it wasn't a whole lot. It was basically just a lot of, of time. I'm really tall, too. So putting on muscle is actually more harder for me <laughs> to sure. put on. Um, so I definitely did more like my back was twice a week. And then I went to legs twice a week. My split was a bit different. Um, more volume. I find the volume works better for me. Um, it's a bit more higher reps. A lot of drop sets, holding sets, incorporated more of those in for me. And the biggest thing too was um, my cardio changed. Um, I did more short sessions of some hit versus okay. more steady, longer steady sessions. That seemed to, to help me, especially a lot in the beginning of the of the prep. And then I could add some more kind of steady as, as the carbs and energy went down, mm -hmm. then I had to kind of go to steady, but um, I found that really helped me as well. Yeah. And Justin, that's something you changed over the years. You used to be all lists early yeah. on. Really yeah, early on. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It used to be, I mean, in late nineties, early two thousands, it was two hours a list. That's what you did. Right. But then, you know, really analyzing, it's like, man, I can do, and I do, a, I do a more of a, well, a couple different versions, but I do a more modified hit. Cause I do, I work with a lot of bodybuilders. These guys aren't going to be running sprints. And so I look at it as what, how can we maximize calorie burning while also maximize like what we're getting out of it in the gym, which is like, you know, our, our training endurance. And so I do like one minute hard, one minute light. And obviously you're not sprinting for a minute, but basically the intensity is dictated that if you, you push as hard as you can for a minute so that you can just barely recover in the next minute to push hard for another minute. And it kind of mimics a set, you know? So in that case, cause you know, some of my guys are over 300 pounds, like Joe Seaman's 310 right now. And doing it, you know, doing a 20 rep set of squats, if you don't have that conditioning, it's not a leg exercise, that's a lung exercise. You fail when your lungs fail trying to move 300 pounds of body weight around. And so we do that. And I figure, I find you can get almost twice the calorie count per minute uh, compared to compared to lifts. I mean, it really is quite a bit of difference. You do, you do 20 minutes of lifts, and in my way, only 10 minutes are actually really hard. And it's, it's like doing 35 minutes of lists, you know, mm -hmm. and you know, it's, you know, it's only 60% of the, the time for the same amount of calories. Why not? But again, like you said, when carbs and especially fats get low, it don't, it doesn't work anymore. Yeah. It's, that it's one minute of hard take. goes to like 30 seconds and then, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, but no, it was I... hard for me to get into that mindset too, because like you said in the beginning, when I started, it was like you did your, you got up, you did your fasted cardio, you did your weights, mm. and then I did cardio before I went to bed. And it was like, really, I'm only doing like, you know, yeah. 20 minutes of, of sprints. And then, you know, I cool down and that's it. Like mentally, it was almost feeling guilty that I wasn't yep, doing yeah. more. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. But I was fuller. My muscles were fuller. I wasn't as flat. So as the prep kind of went on, I was like, okay, I, I can see this working better and better. Yeah, I'm glad you said that because a lot of people because because list is so built into the industry, you know, people think, you know, I don't like all well, the guys always worry about losing muscle. And it's I'm like, mm -hmm. it's the opposite. It's what you just said, you stay fuller. It's like, if you went to the rest of the world, and you told them you I don't want to work really hard. I don't want to exercise really hard because I'll lose muscle. They'll look at you like what? Don't you act that's the opposite, right? They, you know, look at sprinters in the Olympics. They look like they but it's like, it's really hard to get that through people's heads. They, they you know, we're really, you know, two hours on the treadmill is gonna is what's gonna eat away leg tissue. It's not those 30 second hard sprints on a step mill. You know, it's, it's, it's the long stuff. Yeah. And as a female too, we often hold fat in mm -hmm. our, in our lower, right? So we're constantly yeah, yeah. mentally wanting yeah. to do more and more, right? To get rid of that, that yeah, fat. Yeah. But and that well, the training and you, too, and too much cardio can make you hold it too. Yep, right? So yeah, 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 yeah. And then even more so. I mean, you can't really spot reduce, but obviously, mm -hmm. to, when you're oxidizing fat, what happens is fat is being burnt, you know, converted to ATP in the bloodstream. So it has to have blood flow, you know. And you, I mean, anyone could do this. If you if you're walking on a treadmill and you, you know touch your glutes, they're not hot. They're not. They're cold. They're cool because they're not really putting. Now do the step mill. 
on a high intensity 30 seconds or a minute and feel your glutes after that. Very warm, lots of blood flow there. So you can't pick where fat is going to be burned, but you need the blood flow to burn that fat. And there is blood flow there, more blood flow there compared to walking on a treadmill. And over time, you have to assume that's going to be, you know, it's going to oxidize slightly more fatty acids from that area of the body. Right, right. No, it's interesting with layering in the the hit training because I recently just a uh, uh, powerlifting uh, smaller frame female. You know, I was working for her, so it's a really small margin of error. But that was just one little tweak we did because the food was getting down a little low and was you know layered in just starting with twelve minutes of lists and then going to go up to fifteen, but like three to four sessions of that in in lieu of um, or excuse me of of hit in lieu of lists and like that'll help you know just get that bump that caloric burn a little bit up, but um. I did want to go back to one thing you said earlier for listeners out there as well. I'd be interested to hear when you said two days a week of back. I know there's a long time ago, some of the day does, and this might have might have been just like meathead ish of us, but we used to do like a back thickness and back width day, yeah. Justin. You remember that? Um, oh, yeah, yeah. I'm just curious, like how did you split up yeah. your your back routines? Was there any difference as far as it was kind of similar to that yeah. actually? Okay. That we do, yeah. So good. Yeah. We're, we're not completely old guys. Yeah, I mean, it, it, you know, <laughs> I find that it still works, right? Why yeah, reinvent it, the wheel? Some stuff still works. Exactly. I think it's, you're, it's probably a poor way of discussing it because it's not like you can build the back thick this way and then work. Right, right. And only, you know, the muscles either grow or they don't. But on some days, if you're emphasizing, you know, muscles like the lumbar and the traps and the upper back, and the next right. day you're emphasizing the lats. I mean, it does make sense. Of course, we have to add like a weird meathead terminology to it that doesn't make sense, but. <laughs> right right yeah he has it always right in the end the science always yeah. proves the meatheads were right yeah, that's how we simplify it <laughs> so and, and was there any uh like a mixture ever of any like lower rep ranges on certain days or, or and then higher on others or was it always volume um if i did the lower i would do more of a drop set or pyramid style so i'd go down to maybe four to six reps but i always finished with a burnout session at the okay end to like 15, what's a burnout for you like oh, okay i just found that especially with legs once I started going to a certain point, which is really heavy for me, I couldn't engage with it as much. And that muscle mind connection to me was more important than just lifting the weight, which mentally can kind of bug you too. Cause once you get into that, oh, hey, look how much I can lift and let's see the max I can lift. But when I did that, my strength was going up, but my muscle wasn't going up. Yeah. And that's when it I was mean, like, you know, I had other people have to remind me too that, you know, you're not a power lifter, it doesn't matter. No judge cares how much you leg press or yep. how much you squat. You got to grow those legs. <laughs> right. right? So also you said that too, especially for legs, because if you can, if you think about it and break it down, it makes a lot of sense. Because there's a lot of muscles in the leg. You know, there's there's the you know four just in the front of the quad. You know, you got three hamstrings, you got your adductors, sartorius, and so you can you know when you're lifting heavy, it's very easy to 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 learn how to distribute that load over all those muscles pretty evenly. You know, and push more weight. But neither, none of those individual muscles are really working quite as hard, you know. And I think it, it plays out if you look at a power lifter's physique. They typically have weak, you know, smaller legs and smaller arms. Now, some muscle groups like a back, they have thick backs or chest because there's not much you can do. You're either using your, you're either pressing or something or not. There aren't as many muscles involved. But with the legs, I think that's what people, a lot of people don't see what you saw early on that, that you know, it's not just the weight. I have to make sure the right muscles are moving the weight. Yeah. Right. And that was the other thing I actually did um, for that year off between 2019 and coming back was um, I didn't do much arm work. Like I did almost a year of no arm work. And instead mm -hmm. I focused on back, shoulders, legs, hamstrings, and a little bit of chest. And that was my rotation. And then later on, I brought back the bicep curls and tricep press downs and things like that. Cool. But I just worked on the bigger muscle groups, which again, mentally can be hard too when i was telling people i'm like i'm not training yeah. those right now right they're looking at me like but why are you, why are your arms good you got big arms yeah. <laughs> and i was like yeah but you got to understand when i'm training chest when i'm training back when i'm training shoulders you know Recruiting they arms. have to work right no one's got a um a big chest and a big back and no arms right so yep. that was another yeah, thing i did too yeah. was just focus on those muscle groups i have a i have a question going back to your comparison photo it looked like your rear delts really improved and I think that's a really important muscle for, for your, your division because it, so much of it is shape. And you think width, you'd think side delts. Mm -hmm. You'd think uh, width, you'd think side delts. But really, like, when you're standing there more in the front relaxed, if you really look at what's kind of capped out, it's, you know, in the front relaxed, if I'm like this, my, 
my side, you can't really see my side delt is if facing forward. What's you know, my rear delt is really what shows the width. And I think that you, I think you, you can kind of see it there. I mean, obviously, your lats came up a lot also, but I think you can see like how much more width it really shows there with the extra thickness there. Did you do anything? I know you did back twice a day. I guess rear delt should be tied in with that a little bit. But was there any special shoulder yeah, focus or I, anything? On one of my back days, I had finished with rear delts. I always did some sort of rear delt. Cool. On shoulder day and back day. Yeah, I found like different. I know Justin and maybe, I don't know if this changed for you, Justin. It was earlier when we were training together, but you would just fling weights and your rear delts would uh, yeah. seem like they responded. But I, I've mm -hmm. taken a lot of like, even like TRX bands to like activate the muscle more, if you will, like just kind of get some blood flow and then I can do like a heavy set, like just something to like get it moving there. Cause I, I just felt like because I did a lot of shot put discus football mm -hmm. pressing, like I had such just an anterior rotation in my chest and shoulder that it was really hard to, for me to get that a full contraction in the rear delts and just upper back area. But, um, but no, yeah, definitely had, you know, had some, had some changes there. Is that, did that change for you, Justin, over the years, or is that kind of always just an area you were pretty there? Yeah. My shoulders were just, yeah, you know, everyone's got their body parts that just grow easily shoulders and triceps for me, are always strong. You know, I, unfortunately though, my chest always sucks and that's like the one body part that you, that you don't want to suck, but but yeah, my shoulders still grow. I actually, I don't think I've trained rear delts in probably at least three years. Oh, wow. But I also look like I haven't trained rear delts in three years. <laughs> well, but yeah, it's kind of interesting though, because uh, a lot of people think too, well, because you can bend, you know, it back, especially in your powerlifting prime. I mean, what was your highest bench? Well, it was shirted, but 725. Yeah, yeah. so 725 bench, but yet, you know, the chest was a no was chest. An issue. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Well, good stuff. Um, you know, that was good to walk through the the training and kind of get an idea. Uh, just to to you know tie some of that or wrap some of that up. Like, what what's the next step? What's the next show you're you're kind of hoping for to get after? And what are some goals or body parts maybe you're working on as you look at look ahead at the next show for you? Um, so I've been working on again just kind of improving everything, building my shoulders up a bit more. Biggest thing is my quad sweep, my legs. Are always a challenge for me that's another part that never, you know, yeah, you, look, i've got some shorter friends that they train legs once a week and they're still pumped the next week when i see them yep. but for me <laughs> you know the long legs take a bit so i've been really focusing on on my legs um i haven't quite picked a show yet i'm looking at either this summer like the van pro uh pro amateur qualifier um or the one in toronto in uh which would probably be october so we're just kind of looking to see how I'm looking and we'll go from there. How, now, does, the the one... Sorry, how does the qualifying go in Canada? How long do you remain? Are you like, are you just going straight for, for the pro card now or how many years do you get to remain qualified or, or how does the requalification work? Yeah. So it used to be, um, you'd have qualified. If you made top three, you would have two years. If you made top mm -hmm. five, you'd have one year. Um, and then, depending if you did well at a qualifier. So like if you made top five at a pro qualifier, again, you'd have another year to keep doing that and you wouldn't have to requalify at a regional show. Um, because I haven't competed in Canada now since 2019, oh, yeah, yeah. I'm going to have to requalify. Um, I've already tried to ask, see if the Arnold amateur would do something for me, but unfortunately it won't. So um, the nice thing about it is there's a lot of regional shows that are really close to the pro qualifiers. So for example, if I did the van pro qualifier, I would just need to qualify the weekend before top three oh, and nice. the next weekend I can just go. So, and that's the same within the fall too, is I just pick one that's back to back. So I don't have to nice. hold out so long. So yeah. Got it. Yeah, Vancouver pro ams a really good show for, I've had a couple competitors, pro and amateur, and they say it really well run. Yeah, yeah, it's a great show. Um, the other thing is, like, if you did Arnold Amateurs or um, Olympia Amateurs, they don't, you don't have to qualify anymore. Like, you can just sign up and do it. Oh, cool. But yeah, and so that, uh, and you mentioned a Toronto, is that the Toronto Pro Show that would be, um, or that, like, that yeah, same weekend? One, there's um, the Canadian Nationals that's okay. in either September or October this year. Got it. So, okay. same thing, it's a Pro Am qualifier. Is that which the one's Joe doing, Justin? Is that in June? Uh, he hasn't said for sure, but yeah, okay. it, May, May and June, yeah, might be there's, so there's, there's three. There's the Toronto Pro Show in June, 
Yeah, that's probably his main show. But is, is there one on the 20, May 27th? Or is that another one? I, I've got like seven people right now deciding on like summer <laughs> shows. And so they're all jumbled in my brain. <laughs> No, all good. But Joe's, yeah, the sure. Toronto. I don't think there's another. I think the only pro shows in Canada that I know of is Vancouver and Toronto. So yeah. June, July. Yeah, that's his main one. But there is a third show. He's coming to the U.S. It must be. Well, let's transition a little bit to your coaching. I mean, I know it's a big part of who you are and what you do as well. Um, you know, we'll get to some of the lifestyle and just crazy transformation examples we have that we'll pull up uh, from your Instagram, but. Um, can you talk a little about like just the competitors you coach? I know you've had quite a few that have been able to, you know, get on stage and make some things happen. Can you just kind of share a little bit about that? Maybe some of your, your top, uh, athletes you work with and how that's come about. Yeah, I, um, well, I've done quite a bit up for the transformation division. A lot of my lifestyle clients have done the transformation shows. So, um, back in June, I had Jack that, that one, um, I had Michelle that was third, uh, actually, that was fourth. Uh, this past one in October, um, I had two girls that were um, second, and then two the boy, guy and a girl that were first. Um, I tend to stick to more lifestyle clients than competitors, and one reason for that is, as as you know, I'm sure they take more time, and yeah. you know, check in, <laughs> check people in don't think that they come every day, and. Yeah, um, and when I compete yeah. myself, I just feel like I can't give a hundred percent to that every day when I'm trying to compete. At are you saying, wait, are you saying the competitors take more or the lifestyle? The competitors. I think the, I think the opposite. I think the oh, lifestyle really? are harder. Yeah. Well, different because the competitor, it's simple. I, I'm going to tell you, you know, you, no leeway, eat chicken and rice. This is what works. <laughs> you don't get a choice, you know, and they just do it where lifestyle, you got to teach them macronutrients. You got to teach them about nutrition teach them when they're you know if you if you lowered their carbs which made their food not taste as good so they added twice as much salt to all their foods for a day you have to teach them that the reason they gained a pound isn't because they gained a pound of fat or because they're allergic to vegetable you know it's for me i think i mean it's more involved maybe i mean obviously you know like the but for is like the competitor list i think is like it's it's more because you, you, you've gone down that road you don't have to explain things they know what they're doing i think lifestyle that's that's it uh, I think lifestyles because you kind of I mean they don't know anything, and so you got to impart like all this knowledge onto them in a way that they can understand. So yeah, that's true. I find the competitors it's more mental support towards the end that yeah. they need yeah. daily, yep. which can take yeah. it yeah. out on you too. Yeah, and <laughs> it's funny because you prep yourself. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah <laughs> well, yeah, and half the time with the competitors, really, what you're doing is just talk walking them off the ledge of of doing too much. You know, right? Because mm -hmm. you get the people are so obsessed, they're like. Coach, I think I should do six hours of cardio a day. Is no, no, you know, that's way. Yeah, yeah, it's funny. Well, let's, yeah, I'll pull up some of these. Uh, but I've got some competitors that are doing really well. Um, I've got one girl. She just started a prep. She's going to be we didn't just start, but she's going to be doing um, a show in B the BC Cup in in April. Um, she does wellness. She did last year in May. She did a sh her first show and she won every all her classes and the overall. Oh, nice. Um, nice. Another girl that did bikini and she was second in both or all three classes she was second so i've got some up and coming bikini and wellness girls that are going to be competing this year too and then i've got a bunch of lifestyle competitors too that want to do the lifestyle shows as well yeah i'll we'll pull up some of the lifestyle examples and we can kind of cruise around your page you know there's a lot of them so here's a quick uh quick snapshot if you can kind of walk us through uh what's what are we looking at here what's uh could you share some of the accomplishments here and yeah, she she did really well, um, and her muscle and her strength went up like crazy. Her confidence, everything, and um, I remember the exact weight that she ended up losing for that for that challenge. But she she did such a good job, and she was one too that really, as a lifestyle comp like a lifestyle client, took it so serious. Like mm -hmm. everything you told her to do, she would do. Oh, She'd cool. come back from the gym. She goes, oh, I can do more this week. What do you want me to do more this week? Right. And we were able to gradually bump up her training and everything. So she did, she did awesome. Um, That's awesome. Did, That's you, a lot for 12 weeks. Stage shows. She did a challenge, but what's that? I think yeah. another thing with the, with the women, I think that, because like uh, if I work with a, like a, a pro like Joe, 
Joe's eating like 6,000 calories a day some days, you know? And so to lose two pounds of fat a week, you need to burn 30, or to lose a pound of fat a week, 3,500 calories. To burn 2,000, you need to burn, you know, 7,000 calories or 1,000 calories a day. Well, he can do zero cardio, eat 5,000 calories a day and still lose two pounds of fat a week. Where you have an older female, she might only have 1,500 calorie basal metabolic rate. So you right. don't have any leeway, you know? They have to be, you have to really nail it with them. So that's impressive. Yeah. And they have to be willing to listen too and trust yep. you. Mm -hmm. They don't understand the smallest cheat. You know what I mean? Like that smallest yeah. cheat that, I, uh, gosh, if we've done the math before, but it was something like, you know, what, 50 calories. I'm sure you can do it in your head, Justin, but uh, it was like 50 calories off over like in one year, like how much weight that would equate to. Oh, yeah. Like, 10 ca Yeah. I mean, 10, was it 100 calories a day is 10 pounds a year. And that's, that's what it that's was. Yeah, yeah. That's a yogurt, yep. you know? Yep. And, the, and, and, and you get, yeah, when you're 50 years old, that you know, that's five hundred pounds from th from things you wouldn't even think. You know, grabbing a handful of nuts here and there. You know, or or like you know, it's so it's they yeah. The females have no room for air. You, you got to be spot on. Well, that's with like the little sauces, the extra coffee creamer, the this and that when yeah, they're dieting. Yeah. If they don't, if they're not communicating with their coach, it's like, why are you not losing weight? Well, I I mean, I use olive oil. It's healthy, and I use this cream in my coffee, yeah. and it's like yeah. Well, that's well, that's one one level tablespoon of olive oil a day would be 12 pounds of fat with the calories a year you know mm -hmm. and you do that for 30 years you, you got 40 40 pounds of fat and you could eat perfect everything else yeah, yeah. the other thing with um, women tend to be way more scale obsessive yes right yes. oh yeah so for example like even her if there was weeks that the scale didn't move but she's sending me pictures and i'm going Look at this. Yep. Like you can yes. see the difference. Her clothes are fitting yeah. different. The muscles there, right? So that is another, I would say, bigger challenge too with more lifestyle compared to the competitors and compared to athletes because we're just, yeah, we true. don't really care about the scale. Yeah, they understand. <laughs> we care yeah. about well, everything get, else, right? Yeah. You're